we continue to learn about the implications of COVID, uh, particularly as it relates to the likelihood of someone becoming infected and also the outcomes that uh, would occur if a person has a specific uh, diagnosis of COVID. So at uh, the ESMO meeting and other recent meetings, we've seen data that uh, seem to suggest that for certain cancer patients, there may be a worsened outcome associated with a COVID infection. Now, this statement should not be uh, used or taken as a blanket statement. There are many subtypes of cancer. There are many subgroups, stages, and points in the journey of the person's cancer where, where the uh, infection with COVID may or may not be uh, worsened. It just stands to reason, and we've seen from some of the studies that, that have been presented, that if you look at patients who have a more advanced cancer, who are more debilitated, patients who have pulmonary disease, of course, they're going to be more susceptible for more serious outcomes. But if you have patients with early cancers, patients who have had a recent surgery but are now going through chemotherapy, and even some patients that have limited scope of chemotherapy, uh, probably their outcomes won't be as different as, as those from the general population. So. I think it's important as we talk to patients not to make just broad blanket statements and try to narrow down what a potential infection might mean in their unique situation. The COVID pandemic has changed and probably will change uh, forever how we practice medicine. And there are two aspects of this. One is how we reacted and what patients might be thinking and, and, and feeling regarding the continuity of their care, their selection of care, uh, their willingness to go to a health center. And number two, and I'll explain on those, those two points uh, subsequently, is how we actually deliver that care. Uh, we have learned quite a bit, and, and, and now that we have a better understanding and we have the, the right infection prevention measures, I think patients need to be reassured that, that their continuation of care is, is critically important and that the risk of transmission within a healthcare system, the nosocomial transmission is really uh, uh, very, very low. Uh, for most cancer patients who are dealing with an active cancer diagnosis, their greatest threat is the cancer itself, it's not COVID. And we have learned from, from, from large studies, uh, for instance, there's one that was presented by Dr. Varana from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, where, where you can clearly document that delays in starting the treatment for a cancer diagnosis is associated with a shorter survival. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that. Delays in starting treatments associated with a decreased survival. So for our patients, we need to provide them with your reassurance. We need to uh, tell them specifically how we in our offices, in our hospitals are changing practices. But for the most part, they're going to be safe. It's inconvenient. They might need to get testing. They might have some limitations in the number of visitors. Uh, but, but the provision of oncology care must and should continue. Uh, otherwise, we'll see bad outcomes. On the positive side, we were able to very quickly pivot uh, to change a lot of our practices to remote management. So that is the so-called telemedicine or you know, remote care. And it involves a number of solutions uh, that were kind of thought as perhaps attractive in the past, but were greatly accelerated and are now at the forefront of what we do in medicine. So uh, we practice with uh, telephone consultation, video consultation, remote monitoring for laboratories. And I always like to say that the genie is out of the bottle. Everyone sees there is a great value in this in, in many, many ways, in ways that one would not immediately anticipate. Uh, we have uh, patients who travel from afar to our centers to get uh, uh, opinions about uh, a, a point in their care. And they can do that now from the convenience of their homes. The economic benefit of this is tremendous. So imagine someone who can't drive, who needs a care, you know, a caregiver that's going to bring them here, who has to take a day off of work. Sometimes they have to pay for lodging, for gas. Uh, for meals, again, the decreased revenue from not working, it's a big, big uh, cost that is incurred for the patient and for the family. In contrast, if we can connect with them, and, and I realize we can't always do it completely uh, remotely, but if we can't connect remotely um, and, and, and other family members join, I think, I think that's, that's a great proposition. So that would be my, my, my first example. The second one, and one that needs to be considered very carefully, is that remote medicine allows the more uh, specialized and the more sophisticated uh, uh, 
cancer care reach patients in, in areas where they traditionally would have a harder access. And, and, and this opens all sorts of new doors as well too for individuals with lower socioeconomic status, uh, more remote or rural areas that otherwise would not have access to this type of cancer care. As we have transitioned to telemedicine, we are uh, finding that this is going to change how we interact amongst ourselves within our institution, with our colleagues, with our referring physicians, and with clinical trials organizations. I think people are embracing the idea of, of uh, remote connectivity, not only for the direct visits for the medical care, but for the clinical trials, uh, remote monitoring, uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, uh, remote uh, uh, laboratory, you know, so that you can obtain samples so they can be centrally shipped. Um, I, I am very happy to see that these changes in telemedicine are not exclusive to the academic medical centers, but really in the community practices, they're also um, highly engaged in that regard. Now, patients and doctors love it. It, it turns out that in the, in the old way, let's call it what, you know, a few months back was our standard practice, I'm going to call it the old way. There was no reimbursement unless a person shows up to the offices. Patients knew that, doctors knew that. So there were appointments that were, had to be done for that reason alone. I think we can, we can uh, sometimes provide long-term monitoring without having to physically have the person in front of us. Sometimes even with a simple monitoring of laboratories, uh, I particularly like the, 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 the system that we get to our medical record that I can track where they are with their progress without the patient physically having to come. And I can always call them in if needed but then I can reserve my time, my expertise, and why not, my energy to those areas that require greater engagement from a physician perspective.